Hi, and welcome back. I'm Neil. Hi, I'm Libby. Hi, Libby. Hi, I'm Libby. not Jason Gibson. No, I'm sorry. He not. was sitting here. Sorry to <laughs> disappoint you and shock you out of your chairs. Um, Jason, as we told you, it is a very successful attorney and a very busy guy. And we were very lucky to have him for 45 minutes. And he had to go deal with some business. He has to go take care of some business. But we're going to take care of some business also. You know, the industry filmmaking industry television starts with a script you have to have a writer somebody has to have the the story in their head yeah like and can get it through their fingertips yeah. and that's you cynthia well i'm a writer and i've written screenplays uh, not anything that's been made but i've studied the the screenplay business for years and uh, you can have a bad movie with a good script you can have a uh, a good movie with a bad script, but you can't have a movie without a script. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it it starts with the with the written word. I mean, mm -hmm. even even a documentary has a, has a, a a format, has a theme. Uh, Speaking but, of, have y'all seen The Keepers yet on no. Netflix? Okay, mm -hmm. well, go home and check that out. It's a great documentary. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's kind of like on the lines of a making a murder and i'd love to get y'all's take on netflix later in the show after we kind of chat just because i feel like it's changed a lot of things so oh. anyway go ahead about screen okay writing well it it, it starts with the the written word on the page yeah or, or the idea the concept and a lot of people have ideas Rick, Rick and i know this there are ideas all over the place for for films but until it becomes a, a, a hard written document it, it's still an idea uh, and then but then it's still only a blueprint mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of writers get defensive because I don't want the words changed or that I don't want don't don't change my baby don't change my script but but in it it's one thing if it's a novel but right. if it's a screenplay that is a blueprint for a film that it it has to be interpreted mm -hmm. further by further artists the director uh, uh, and the cinematographer that I'll bring something to it and it might not be the vision that the writer had to begin with mm -hmm. but that's because it it evolves into something and when it finally evolves to become the film on the screen that the end product it's not what it may not even be much like what it began mm -hmm. uh, as it began but the end product is it's the work of a lot of different talented artists to bring it to be right because as a screenwriter uh, you write a script, and your manager and your agent critique it and say, change this, change that. Then it goes to a network, or I mean, in this case, um, a production company, mm -hmm. who say, change this, change that. Then it goes to a distri distribution company who might be doing some advance mm -hmm. uh, financing. Right. Mm -hmm. Change this, change that. Then it goes to the set. And then you have a director who says, change this, change that. Then it goes to the hands of the actor. Mm -hmm. who say I'm not saying that <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it like that right. these words are too hard to get out this is better stated this way so the original screenplay is very often v has little to do with what you see on the screen yes. which is very That's, frustrating yeah. to a writer because writers love words mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. words and sentences are everything to a writer yeah and uh, there's a saying with uh, screenwriters that you have to learn to kill your babies <laughs> because uh, there are your words are your babies yeah and and what you've produced that's come out of the ether out of your heart and soul and put down on the paper and somebody somebody says cut that out of yeah. it you go oh stab me in the heart yeah. well they take whole scenes but you have out. to learn oh, sure to do that because otherwise it'll never There's get no made. Other way. So you, if you want to have it made, you have to make sacrifices. Art and Kill commerce, commerce and art, the, the eternal battle. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Well, in all aspects of film, you have to develop a pretty thick skin, whether mm -hmm. you're an actor or you're a director or you're a writer, mm -hmm. because there's input from innumerable <laughs> sources that make decisions on what the final product is going to be. Yeah, it's a lot different than if, if you, like I'm, I'm writing a book right now, and, mm -hmm. and it actually started out as a screenplay, but I that felt like maybe it might be better to start it, to do it in book form first to see what it de develops because mm -hmm. the forms of writing are so different and how they end up are so different because in a in a novel you have an editor who will make changes change that sure. kind of stuff mm -hmm. and a publisher but that's pretty much it 
But with the screenplay, it just goes on and on and on and on until it becomes a movie and, and yeah. it's a whole animal to itself. And how hard is it to take a book that has been done so many times and adapt it to the screen? I mean, do y'all know much about that process? Adaptation is hard. Okay. Um, because you cannot, if you have, say you have a best-selling book. Uh-huh. Like, let's Big a Little Lies. Book. Did y'all see the, I mean, it was a six-part miniseries or seven-part, Big Little Lies. Oh. Uh-huh. It was recently uh-huh. on HBO, uh-huh. um, which we fell madly in love with. But that had to be, you know, but they talked about the differences in the book and the screenplay. Right. But right. Yes, because you can't take what somebody imagines right. in their head. Everybody who reads a book or even a script, they're going to see it in a completely different way. Right. And so you can't satisfy all those readers who are fans, who are rabid about about this work and please them because they all see it, interpret it in an t- entirely different way. And um, so somebody's always going to be pissed off. Right. <laughs> well, and you also have to, have to satisfy the original writer. The, of right. The right. The author. The author. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, John Grisham, every, you know, uh, movie some that's of them been don't done. care. I mean, right. Like, right. Well, I'm sure level, he's like, John oh, Grisham, it made how you know, much? Yeah, he's like, go ahead and do your thing. <laughs> do your yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that you can also reach a level as a John Grisham and say you're not changing one thing. Right. right. That's right. true. Right. Right. Uh, that's the way it is. Do it or don't. But I don't I'm care. not. That's. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of like. Right. It's all about getting a check. I just think that's fascinating. Once you, you know, when you see it, on, I guess Girl on the Train was one of the last ones I read, you know, first and then saw the movie. And I'm always disappointed in the movie just because you like you're saying you can't please not disappointed but it was a great movie and it was a great thriller and had to not read the book which was you know incredible i wouldn't have had you know this preconceived notion mm-hmm. of what the characters looked like and what right. they what the apartments looked like and what mm-hmm. you know the gone, pubs looked like gone girl was the example for me because that was so different than what yes. i had interpreted the um, when yeah, i was I'm reading i'm so glad the book. i didn't read the book and see, i didn't read the book either i love that movie i love that movie but so you felt the same way i did i just thought the book was great yeah and then the movie was really good too it's just not you the mean way the book I, was greater <laughs> you think because i didn't read the book at my house it was but okay. <laughs> that's what i mean in general but, in your mind <laughs> well bringing it back to houston and and making movies here mm. people who live in Houston, write screenplays, write novels that become screenplays, that become motion pictures. This is a business, and it's a business for the city that not everybody really understands. And this is where the Houston Film Commission is so important. And the Texas legislature is meeting this week. Yes. And on their agenda, agenda, it's every two years, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Is the film industry... The film so incentive. The incentives. Yeah, we and, have and, to have funding. We have to be in that budget. Right. And at this point, we're getting very close to the legislative session being over with. It's over with the 31st of May. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the um, uh, now it's in the, the hands of the uh, conferees, the conference committee. They are the ones that are going to make the recommendation for the funding for the program. Um, and that can happen at 12 midnight tonight. Wow. Which is certainly a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a, it, it's a very complicated process. Um, and maybe it was just my illiteracy before I was tossed into the political <laughs> world. I really didn't know exactly how all of, all of this worked. And you want and to how, education, go to Austin oh, during the session and watch. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and it also is absolutely fascinating. Uh-huh. The way it works. And frustrating. Or does it work? Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and frustrating. You're absolutely right. Um, I'm hoping that the uh, the result of this legislative session, we will see an increase in what we've had the last uh, biennium. I, that's the best case scenario. I'm not sure that's going to happen. I certainly hope it does. Um, well, but, there's a there's one um, a House member that wants to eliminate the, the Film Commission completely, the Texas right. Film Commission. But that's, that, that, was take, that, was, that bill was re- withdrawn. Yeah. So that's okay, not, well, that's but that's the, the mindset of right. some of them Correct. are still going to be voting. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's absolutely yeah. true. They just don't get it. Hmm? They either Is it that they don't get it or they just don't, they don't care about it, it or they don't want it? They don't get it at all. I went to Austin to lobby just a couple of weeks ago for, for the incentives, and we went around it to uh, – I talked to senators as well as to um, House members. And it, it, one particular House member, I talked to his deputy staff member, and he said that 
uh, but do you know how many movies I've gone through all the movies that were made in Texas and some of these movies are so immoral they're so this they're so that somebody's sleeping here and sleeping there and I thought okay I'm out of here Boy, they. <laughs> I'm, Church I'm not going to be able to Let's... convince this guy anything <laughs> no, uh-uh. and another thing he said which is a, a misconception among all a lot of, of legislators is that this is just a temporary business we need full time jobs in Texas we don't want these temporary jobs and said this is not a temporary job this is just like the construction building business Mm -hmm. you build a house okay you build another house Mm -hmm. okay that one's finished you build another house it's not temporary it's just that you complete a project and move on to another project but they don't get that and the better the incentives are the more uh continuity there is in one job to the next job to the next. Correct. And, and we're able to, to keep the support services, the businesses and the individuals and the actors, the crew base, the actors, all of the people that it take to, takes to make a successful film industry. And that money is a lot of money that will be pumped into the, uh, into the state, not only the local coffers, meaning municipal, but also county and especially the state. Now, not all of the legislators, by any stretch of the imagination, have been uh, <laughs> enemies of the program. We have some mm-hmm. very strong supporters of the mm-hmm. program, um, and I'm hoping that those... Uh, well, I will name some names, actually. Donna I was going to say, let's show Carol, them some Carol more. Carol Alvarado has been incredibly helpful okay. uh, and is very supportive and has been very vocal, and we certainly appreciate all of her efforts. Um, uh, Governor Abbott actually is an advocate. He, That's he good to hear. Very, very supportive. And I think if we get this pulled out, this um, legislative session, to where we do get at least what we had previously or we get a little more, a lot of that effort is going to be attributable to Governor Abbott, which we certainly appreciate. That's great. That's yeah. fantastic. It goes back to Rick Perry, though. Rick Perry was, when we first got the incentives, it was Rick Perry. He was really, uh, love him or hate him, he was he was there for the film incentives and, and worked you know, hard with us to, to make it happen. That's great. And then luckily, Abbott. Yeah. Right. Seems as though they might see the big picture. And Perry was able to, to uh, wave his SAG card at numerous events. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a member of Screen Actors Guild? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. He's also a new resident of Round Top, Texas. Okay. Okay. Well, so, we got Rick covered. Yeah, we exactly. Did. Check. So as a, as a call to action, who can people uh, on the business side, on the creative side, and just people who love Houston and want to see the city sparkle in, in films and television, who can they call? Who can they write? Uh, well, the main thing is they need to speak with their legislators, okay. their senator, their uh, representative. That's who they will listen to are their constituents. Right. And this is Texas or Houston? Texas. Texas. Okay. Yes. So all of Texas can participate well, well, in this. The, the, the core of all of this is it comes from the state legislature. Right. Okay. That's where the incentive programs are gotcha. correct, approved or funded and, through the and state whatever, budget. Whatever we might be able to come up with on a municipal level, it's only going to be something that is in addition to the okay. state. Complementary. It will complement what we get with the state. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we need to make sure that our friends and listeners are reaching out to their state representatives and saying, listen, I want, I support this. I think it's important. Um, Something great for Houston. What else, what else has been filmed in Houston? I remember Reality Bites. Way Terms, back of in the day. Terms of Terms Endearment. Terms of Endearment. And Shining Star. Rushmore. Rushmore. Evening Star. Evening was, Star. That, that, that was, was kind sequel. of a follow-up, right. right? And that was right. like on Del Monte or Inwood. What house was that? We drive by it all the time. Uh, the e- of, Evening Star? Mm-hmm. It was, Evening Star was over close to the village. Okay. Uh, because they were trying to duplicate the house that was actually in, I can't remember the part of River Oaks, even though it's not River Oaks, where the original Terms House was. Gotcha. Well, the, the, the two Terms of Endearment houses are on Lock Lane okay. next door to that's each other. Okay, that's Yeah. That's sure. Lock Lane. That's it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's a whole aspect that people don't even think about is the tourism. Uh, right. We were talking in the break. Right. Uh, tourism aspect. People love to see where something was filmed. Oh, totally. Just as much as they love to see run into an actor that was in a film. Sure. Right. And and uh, and even Rick said the Terms of Endearment was filmed how many years ago? And people still want to call his office all the time wanting to know where the house is. Of co- I mean, it's Jack Nicholson and, you know. 
Shirley, Shirley McLean. Are you kidding me? Deborah Winger. Yeah. Well, and, and then another really great thing about the industry is it's it's evolved in Houston is there's an awful lot of international production that goes on here. Mm-hmm. Uh, not necessarily for the American market or the U.S. market, but for um, well, African market, for the Hispanic market, for uh, the European market. There is a absolutely wonderful film called Houston, which is called Houston by a German filmmaker. Um, it got tremendous reviews internationally. Um, it, it had a limited release in the United States, was very, very popular outside of the United States, and that creates its own set of tourism uh, momentum mm-hmm. uh, because it's international. The um, uh, the ballet dancer, uh, oh. uh, Miles' last dancer. Um, oh right! Yeah. It did okay domestically. It did incredibly in Canada, and it also did amazingly in Australia. And the Austra- the fact that it did so well in Australia, there were a lot of Australians that came to Houston because that was the catalyst to spawn their interest in in making a trip here. So wow! And I was on the cutting room floor. I was in that uh, film. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear <laughs> I that. I was in the That's film and a scene at a Rice Epicurean grocery store, but it didn't make it into the film. It was really a wonderful, wonderful film. What's it called? Mao's Last Dance. It's about the um, the uh, the Asian dancer that defected to the United States in the 1970s. When oh, wow. He, he, when he was a visiting artist for the Houston Ballet. Uh, and he didn't true, go back. True story. It is a true story. It's fascinating. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Great, great film. And it's available on Netflix. Okay, that see? Segway right into Netflix. <laughs> Do y'all, I mean, I just feel like Netflix, like the, from the writing, from the original content, from, you know, the millennial aspect where they're like, okay, I can either pay $240 for a cable bill and get all the HBO, you know, whatever. And obviously we're talking about cable more than, you know, film. But, right. you know, and I pay seven ninety nine, and I have I have unlimited, you know, whatever Netflix decides I get to watch. Right. Um. I don't know. Do y'all feel like there's more opportunity? Do you feel like it's taken away from the writing and the the oh, like not, the industry? Oh, no. You think it's just not at all. Okay, so you well think it's, it's it's created a whole new kind of. They're a huge aspect. source of M O N E. That's absolutely true. Yeah. They're like a studio, right? But and they create some of the best television and documentaries right, right. and yeah. you know and and now amazon's doing the same well, thing amazon a, a, a television series called one mississippi which i don't know if you've ever heard of no. no but if you have a chance you need to take a look at it it's it's really brilliant okay um we actually uh, sort of inherited it uh from mississippi it's you know namesake um because of incentive problems in Mississippi, so we were oh, able wow. to take advantage of that little disruption. So and we they, became Mississippi. <laughs> exactly. The uh, Galveston, <laughs> Dickinson, Texas City area all stood in for for uh, for Mississippi. Um, but it's a um, uh, a comedy drama about a woman that goes back to her home in Mississippi because her mother has breast cancer, and then when she goes home to live with her mother to take care of her, then she develops breast cancer. And I know that sounds like there could be no comedic aspect right. to that yeah. whatsoever. you're right. And I cannot <laughs> remember what, and God, I can't remember the comedian's name. It's, it's uh, uh, produced by Louis C.K. Uh-huh. Um, and just a brilliant, brilliant female comedian plays the uh, pl- is, plays the, the lead, and uh, it's bittersweet. It's it's just really charming. One it's Mississippi. One Mississippi. So that's one time, on, and it's okay. on Amazon. Okay. okay. Amazon. And that's well, it's also introduced we... the binge watching. You know, it's like now right. we get twelve episodes, and you kind of you know take it all in for the three tutors. or four days. Yeah. Oh my, oh my god, god, my favorite all, thing I ever. Can't. Um, Ugh. So many. I, I, I mean, could watch it 40 on. times over and over and over. I want to say a little welcome back to Houston to my friend, Leonard Kulka, who is a producer, writer, director, who his very first uh, short, he entered into the European wide, the EU Biennale, 11,000 entries, and at 25 years of age, he one wow. and I picked it, I picked Yay, him up at Intercontinental Leonard. Airport last night from Germany, and so welcome back, Leonard. Hey, Leonard. And he's making hey, an Leonard. investment in the television uh, business in Houston. And he's the thanks for human ever. He is. Oh, he's thank thanks you guys for being so much here. for being what a, here. What an illustrious We've panel. We've learned so much, and learned we will get involved. Get involved. Right. Reach out to your legislators and make them make it happen. 
Thank you, Rick Ferguson, Absolutely. Cynthia you. Neely, Jason Gibson, and thank you, Libs. Thank you, Neil Z. <laughs> and thank and you, Bobby, Bobby Slam, Slam Duncan. Duncan and Radio Brave. <laughs> Till next time. Happy week, y'all.